back is Tom Brannock. Additionally, the first episode of Bloodland's second season has James Nesbitt's gloomy DCI doing some of his old pranks. This time, viewers are aware that Brannock is the notorious assassin Goliath, who murdered paramilitary leaders, both Republican and Loyalist, in the period before the Good Friday Agreement was signed. In the opening sequence, Brannock dons a balaclava and monitors what appears to be a gun-running operation in 1998. Brannock examines the shipment only to find that, in addition to the weaponry, there is a stockpile of gold bars. The weapon smugglers have been effectively eliminated after each received a bullet to the back of the head. There's one unintentionally distracting scene, when Brannock unmasks himself, and viewers might be asking if de-aging CGI a la Scorsese as the Irishman was used on Nesbitt, or was it only an over-application of Just for Men? Switching to the present day, Brannock, along with DS Niam McGovern, has been called out to a murder scene on the shores of Strangford Luff. Colin Foyle, an accountant, is the victim, and Brannock recognizes him right away. He quickly runs home to get an old phone, which he used to text Foyle, whose last message said the gold had to be moved because of construction work, while maintaining secrecy. According to the message, it is still in the same place, but it is in an oil tank. Of course, the tank is empty when Brannock checks it. When the news is delivered to the late accountant's widow, Olivia, in her grand designs-inspired house, it is evident from a distance that she is not your normal grieving wife but rather someone with dark secrets and maybe murder in mind. Thus, a noir-style tea-to-teat between the two starts, during which they realize that neither of them is who they purport to be. These sequences were obviously enjoyed by Nesbitt and Smurfit, who had excellent chemistry together and built up what appeared to be a potentially deadly connection. With his suspicious detective chief superintendent Jackie Toomey breathing down his neck and an increasingly nervous McGovern watching her gaffer's every move, the under-pressure rogue officer is now frantically trying to advance in the murder probe. On the hunt for former soldier-turned-executive driver Robert Darties, who had been chauffeuring Olivia about and was amusingly scheduled to take her to the airport the day after her husband was found slain, McGovern and Brannock are led to Belfast by a lead. However, he vanished after showing up at the Foyle farm while Brannock and McGovern were interrogating the widow. According to Toomey, everything points to a secret relationship as the reason. Naturally, Brannock is keen on finding the gold, which he learns is worth a cool 43 million pounds or more. Brannock's daughter Issy is eager to climb the property ladder, so selling the gold would be advantageous. Hugh Brannock's frantic efforts to get the gold back. With the help of a notation in the accountant's ledger, Brannock follows the true location of the bars to a storage facility with the help of a GPS. Unfortunately, Olivia rushes to the apartment only to find the gold has been taken after being formally questioned at the police station and realizing she is the prime suspect. As she flees the area, and Brannock is pursuing her, a text message reading I'm alive and I want my gold arrives. Who is the gold thief? This is one of the fascinating plotlines that the first episode set up. Are they also in danger of discovering Goliath's identity if they know about the gold? How far will Brannock go to conceal his lethal past? This second series has a lot riding on it. The first season of Bloodlands, which earned the distinction of being the most viewed locally produced drama in our television history last year, polarized crime aficionados, especially with the blunt Marmite ending. All signs point to this series being an improvement over the last one thus far. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to comment. Subscribe and give us a like. Subscribe.